Good morning, everyone. Is, is this thing located in the right place, Ben? Okay. All right. Okay, we're going to continue our study in the book of 2 Corinthians. Last week, we ended with the verse that said, um, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And the, the next chapter kind of continues with that theme. And uh, so we're going to start there in chapter 5, at verse 1. I, I chose as my background this week this picture. Uh, this is an old photograph of a Bedouin family in the Middle East, and uh, they're, they're sitting, sitting in front of their tent, which is their home. The Bedouins are nomads. They travel around and herd sheep and uh, make their living in that way and trading with the local communities. But Paul talks about tents in this uh, chapter, and I thought this is probably the closest uh, picture that I could get to the kind of tent that would have been existing at that time. So, so we're going to talk about tents. 2 Corinthians 5.1 Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. I don't think many of us live in tents, um, but uh, unless we're, we're going camping or something. But what do you think he's talking about, this earthly tent that we live in? Our bodies. I think that's the, I think that's the, the general interpretation of this passage. Um, what, let's talk about that a little bit. What are the quali well, first of all, we're going to talk about tents, but to back up this idea that this is talking about our bodies, Peter uses the same imagery in 2 Peter 1, 13 through 15. I think, whoa, it, uh, okay, I think it right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus has made clear to me. I disconnected it. Uh-oh. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Okay, I think it right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me and I will make every effort to see that after my departure you will always be able to remember these things. So Paul, or Peter is, is speaking of his body as a tent and he's talking about putting that tent aside um, and, and it becomes clear that what he's talking about is his death. Uh, he's talking about his departure and he's trying to remind them of important things before he dies. So, so this is an image of the, our body. Um, why would he use the image of a tent to describe our body? Anybody? Yes. Yes. Oh, got okay. <laughs> Bill first, and then Logan. Okay. Uh, a tent is a temporary living facility, isn't it? It's not something that you think of as permanent. Logan, did you have some? Okay. And Ben. Okay. 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 
Okay, a tent is something that's not very permanent. It's, it's something that you live in temporarily. It, it doesn't have a solid structure like a house. Um, and, uh, and I think that's the idea that he's getting at. This is, puts Christianity at odds with um, secular humanism and atheism. Um, uh, Bill Dresselhaus, a few weeks ago in our Wednesday night class, talked about Sam Harris, who is a famous atheist. And he, one of the books that he's written is called Free Will. And in that book, he starts off with a true story of these two criminals that broke into a house and beat the husband almost to death with a baseball bat. And they tortured and raped and murdered the rest of the family. They stole their money and they burnt their house down. And uh, this is what he writes uh, after he tells us that story. As sickening as I find their behavior, I have to admit that if I were to trade places with one of these men, atom for atom, I would be him. There is no extra part of me that could decide to see the world differently or to resist the impulse to victimize other people. What he's saying is if his body was structured exactly like those men, that that's what he would be. So, so the world believes that we are just material, um, that after your body dies and decays, you cease to exist. But as Christians, we believe that we have a spirit that's just temporarily living in this mortal body. And, uh, and when this body dies, that spirit is going to go to heaven and live with God. So, so that's a major uh, difference in the Christian beliefs from the world's beliefs. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Seems like he's kind of mixing his metaphors here a little bit. Uh, he's comparing our bodies to tents and uh, our heavenly body to uh, a dwelling, a permanent dwelling. But then he's also talking about being clothed and unclothed. Um, and and he, he's saying that he does not want to be naked. That, that was all a little confusing to me. So what does Paul mean by clothed and unclothed? I actually got my concordance out and just started looking through the scriptures that had the word naked in them. And uh, when we think of naked, we just think of a condition that we would be embarrassed to be in if we were in public. But in the Bible, uh, nakedness many times refers to being impoverished or uh, poor or destitute. And a good example of that is uh, Job 1. Uh, remember that Satan decided to attack Job and take away all of his possessions because he thought that if he did that, that Job would renounce God and turn away from God. So God allowed him to do that. So all of his herds and flocks and servants and, and all of his children were taken away and, and destroyed. And, uh, and that's where this passage starts. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. So when Paul says that he does not want to be naked, I think, I think he's comparing 
the poor condition that we're in in our mortal bodies to the rich condition that we will be in uh, when we receive our heavenly body, our heavenly dwelling. <clears throat> okay. He also talks about this idea of, of that which is mortal being swallowed up by life. So what does, what does that mean? I think 1 Corinthians 15 may give us a better uh, explanation. So it, it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So he compares two bodies. The one that we have now is perishable, it's dishonorable, it's weak, and it's natural. The other body that we'll receive in the future is imperishable. It will be glorious, it will be powerful, it will be spiritual. Um, so, so this body is going to be made, I mean, we're going to receive one that's imperishable and glorious. And, and I think that's kind of the idea that he's getting at, that now he considers himself naked or impoverished in the body that he has. And from what we know about Paul, I think he suffered a lot in his physical body. He had, most likely he had some kind of eye problem, and uh, he had been beaten, and he had, had suffered lots of things in his life. Okay, let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.5. 5. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Okay, what is this very purpose that he's talking about? What was the last thing in, in the previous verse? Okay, he says, we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. So after he says that, he says, now it is God who has made us for this very purpose. So God's purpose for us is to be made immortal. That, that's what he's planned for us. Let's look at some verses that talk about God's purpose. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So let, let's look at these things that God has purposed. He's, he's purposed to save us, his purpose, his purpose is to call us to a holy life. His purpose is to destroy death. And his purpose is to bring life and immortality. And he revealed all of these things through his son, Jesus Christ. He brought all of these things to pass through, through Christ. How, how long has God had this purpose? Yeah. It says he purposed this before the beginning of time. So 
So that should make us feel pretty good that God's been planning for us to have eternal life, to not have to uh, suffer death eternally. Uh, He's called us to a holy life, and he saved us. That's been God's purpose before uh, he even created the world. And, uh, and we need to be thankful for that. Yes. Okay, yeah, uh, it's, this is something I've been seeing a lot in my studies, that God has provided forgiveness for our sins, but that's not so that we can just live the way we want and get forgiveness. His purpose is to give us a way to be holy. He wants us to live a holy life and, and to put away sin and to live for him. Um, it's not... He isn't providing grace so that we can just do what we want. Ben? Okay, yeah, we need to be good stewards. Okay, in this last verse we read, he said it, that God has given us his spirit as a deposit and guarantee. What does, what does he mean by that? What, what is a deposit? Okay. Okay, yeah, when, uh, uh, the, another word for it that the King James Version uses is earnest. How many of you have bought a house and put down earnest money? That, yeah, the purpose of that is to show that you're serious about buying this house. You don't have the money to pay for the whole thing at that point. You haven't arranged the loan and all that, but... You're putting down a certain amount of money to show that this is my house. I'm buying this house. And if you change your mind, you lose that money in it, and it hurts. Um, so, so that's the idea. We haven't achieved. 
we haven't received eternal life at this point. But God has put his spirit in us as a deposit or a, an earnest or a, a Ephesians, we're going to look at a different word that it uses. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So he uses the same words here, deposit, that's guaranteeing our inheritance, but he also uses the word seal. Uh, are you guys familiar with what a seal was in the Roman Empire? Okay, yes. Okay, yeah, it was, it was a, an official representation. I have a picture here. This is an ancient signet ring, and uh, you wore that on your finger, and uh, if you were going to send a document to someone and you wanted to make sure that they knew it was an official, you would take that ring and press it into wax or clay, and it would leave that uh, symbol there. And the person who received the document would would see that, yeah, this is this is from uh, the governor or, or the king or, or whoever it was from. So in the same way, Paul uses that symbolism to say that when uh, God puts His Spirit within us, that's His seal. That that means you're His, and that that He has a claim on you, and that in the future you're going to. Uh, receive the promises that he's given to us. Uh, ben. Yeah, and they have a special stamp. Right. Dennis? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so so this was something that proved that this was true and official and, and who it was from. And the spirit is our seal. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 7. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. So what is it that gives us this confidence? Okay, our, our faith gives us confidence. What did he just talk about? The, yes, oh. We just talked about the seal and the deposit and the guarantee. Yeah. It's a guarantee, and that's why we're confident. So even though we haven't received eternal life and all the blessings that have been promised, we, we believe that we're going to. And then he ends that by saying, we live by faith, not by sight. And that, that goes back to this idea that we looked at last week, that we fix our eyes on what is unseen rather than what is seen. We don't see God directly yet. We don't, we don't see heaven, but but we believe that they exist, and that's what we put our trust in. Okay.
Okay, verses 8 through 10. We are confident, I say, and would be prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Okay, so we have this confidence, and we w- would like to be at home with the Lord, but at this time, we're stuck in this body for, for a while. And, uh, and he says, because of this, we make it our goal to please him. And then I want to talk about the second part of this passage. We're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done, while in the body, whether good or bad. Does this mean we are going to be saved by our works? It sounds like he's judging us by what we do in this body. So, yes, Luke. If we have what? If we have work to do, we are we have sought we have ceased to walk in step and um ceased to um if we have done the mission, if we did do the job we even do it in a million ways. Okay. 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 Yeah, let's let's look at three passages that I think will kind of shed some light on this idea. First of all, Ephesians two, eight through nine. <clears throat> For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So he makes it clear here that we're not being saved by our works. Um, We're saved by grace, and that grace is given to us through our faith. But then you go to James, and he says... What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? And then I skipped some and went to the next part. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. 
So the whole idea of James is that we're saved by faith, but if you have the right kind of faith, it's going to produce works. It's going to motivate you to do the things that Lou is talking about and uh, to evangelize and to help the poor and to uh, be kind to people and, and uh, whatever else is involved in, in our, the love that Christ wants us to do. So, so if we say we have faith, but we're never motivated to do anything, then we're deceiving ourselves. Yes? Okay. That's right. It, it's, it's not the works that save you. It, it's the faith and the grace, but, it's, but that faith motivates you to have works and and if it's not motivating you to have works then then there's something wrong with your faith right that's right they they go together they're tied together then we have a kind of a frightening passage in Hebrews chapter 10 if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment. How many of you are sin-free? How many of you have sinned in the last week? <laughs> All of us. Um, but are we sinning deliberately? What's the difference between sin in weakness and sinning deliberately. Okay, knowing that you're doing it is part of it. Okay, yeah. And in Romans chapter 7, uh, Judy's referring to Paul said that he sins even though he doesn't want to sin. And uh, so that's not sinning deliberately. He's trying his best not to sin, but he's failing. Uh, do you, I think deliberate sin is where you just say, I don't care what God wants. I'm going to do what I feel like. And, uh, and as when you do that, this, this passage in Hebrews 10 uh, goes on to say that you're trampling on the blood of Christ that you're you're just willfully sinning you don't care uh, you don't care what he did for you you're just doing what you want to do carolyn yeah yeah people have that idea that god's going to forgive me that's Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? Uh, that's the question. Paul said, no, by no means. We're, we're supposed to try not to sin. Uh, out of gratitude and out of uh, the desire to please the Lord. Yes, Ben. This goes back to what we looked at earlier. God's purpose for us is to be a holy people. He wants us to live in heaven with him, and he wants us to be holy. He, he doesn't want unholy people living with him. And he's given us the, the way to achieve that. He's going to help us. But we have to have the desire 
to, to live that holy life. And if we don't have that desire, then we're, we're not in the right relationship that we should be with God. Okay. Um, First Corinthians 5, 11 through 15. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. So he just got through talking about the judgment, and uh, that, that's a scary subject. And he follows that by saying, since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. There, there's an element of fear in our relationship with God. We have to respect we have to respect him. What? But it could also be if you don't fear the majesty of who he is and what he can do to you. Uh-huh. You're not looking at it exactly right. I mean, he is anything but loving to save you from it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And when I didn't realize that I had to change the heart I gave to God and walk the way he wanted, not the way I wanted, the way he wanted, things started to change. Okay. Okay. And I know there's different tempers. I know everyone has it. And it, it works, but it's his way, not mine. That's right. We, we can't do it on our own, but, but we do have to have the desire to be the kind of people God wants us to be. And then he promises that he will help us achieve that. Right. Bob? Yeah. Okay. Okay, June. That's right. Yeah, God, we don't. We don't want to just live our lives in terror. God has uh, provided grace for us, but, but we do need to have a healthy fear of, of what he can do if, if we're disobedient and if we don't care. Uh, better get to these last verses. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. I think in this verse he's referring again to these false apostles. Or he sarcastically refers to them as the super apostles. Um, 
men who um, were trying to disparage, discredit Paul. And, uh, and, and he's trying to show the Corinthians that his motives in his ministry are pure, that, he, that his heart is in the right place. Those uh, false apostles were saying things like, in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. In other words, they're, they're looking on the outward appearance. They're looking on worldly standards. And uh, Paul's trying to show them that what's in the heart is, is what matters. Then in 2 Corinthians 5.13, he says, If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. This, this verse was kind of puzzling to me. What, what's he talking about being out of his mind uh, or being in his right mind? Uh, made me think of the time when he was appearing before Festus, when he's arrested and before he's sent to Rome. Festus said, Paul, you are mad from your uh, learning, from your great learning. It has driven you mad. And uh, in Athens, they called him a babbler. So I think one of the things that Paul was accused of sometimes was being crazy. And uh, this maybe these apostle, false apostles are accusing him of that to discredit him. Yes? Okay. Yeah, Paul, I don't think Paul thought he was crazy, but he's just saying whatever we're, whatever it is, we're doing this for the right motives, for your sake and for God's sake. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So here's a second motivation that Paul talks about. First, he talks about he's, he's uh, motivated by the fear of the Lord. Here he says he's motivated by the love of Christ. And those, those are two motivations that we should all have. We should be motivated by our fear of the Lord, and we should also be motivated by our love for Christ, the love of Christ. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Um... We, we need to look at people differently than, than we do in a worldly way. When you look at people in a worldly way, you, uh, you don't care about them as much. You don't think they have as much value. Um, if we look at them from God's point of view, we realize that all the people around us are valuable, that God has, God has sent his son to save all these people. And then the final verse, or not the final verse. <laughs> All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. 
We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Um, so this word reconciled appears over and over again in this passage. He, that is Paul's mission. When you're reconciled to somebody, what does that mean? Why? Yeah, you're on good terms. If, if you're reconciled, it means that before you were reconciled, you were enemies. And, and we were enemies of God before uh, we accepted Christ. And so he's reconciled. He's made peace with us. And um, in the final verse of the chapter, I think, sums it up really well. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Christ had no sin. He took our sins on himself. All of this was done so that we could become righteous people and live with God forever in heaven. That's the gospel in a nutshell. So we better stop. I'm over time. But, but thank you so much for, for all of your uh, comments this morning.